There are just 56 of them, but those 56 words are the heart of the Declaration of Independence, one of the most radical documents of governance ever written. Our founding fathers declared for themselves and their descendants their belief that all men are created equal. That was a radical idea at the time. No kings, no queens, no nobles, no serfs, all men created equal. To put that in context, that notion was as revolutionary a thought in the political sciences as the notion that the earth revolved around the sun, not the other way around, which had been the dominant thought in the physical sciences since the beginning of time. But they didn't stop there. Now, others might have thought, all men are created equal. Yeah, that's a good day's work. Now, let's kick back and have an ale. But not our founding fathers. They were just getting started. So they added more revolutionary thoughts that men are endowed by their creator with unalienable rights. Now that's two more radical thoughts. First, that God gives them the rights directly rather than giving them only whatever, the, whatever rights the sovereign chooses to give. And second, that those rights are unalienable, which means they cannot be taken away. Those rights include life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this is key too, that to secure those rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their powers from the consent of the governed. That's a mouthful, but think about it. That's a, the mission statement of the government, of government, to secure these rights. That's it. That's all government is supposed to do, secure these rights. These rights, which come to us, from our creator, not from the government. Those 56 words explain what, it is, what it, it is about America that makes us different. If anyone ever asked you to explain American exceptionalism, use those 56 words. Sadly, far too many of our fellow citizens don't know this. They've forgotten it, or perhaps they never learned it in the first place. Imagine how different public attitudes towards public policy might be if everyone agreed with those basic principles and understood what they mean. So we think it would be helpful in our experiment in self-government to have school children recite these 56 words at the beginning of each school day. Let them learn what makes America exceptional from the ground up and be reminded of it every day. We're going to launch a project to see if we can't get legislation passed in every single state that children, school children will begin their school day reciting those 56 words so that by the time they graduate high school, <laughs> and by the time they graduate high school, they'll understand what makes America different. So you're probably wondering if that's a small project, what's a big one? And that's a plan to deal with the single greatest threat to our collective individual liberty, our national debt. And the simple fact is, we won't be able to reduce and resolve our national debt until we get a handle on what's driving federal government spending, and that is our unsustainable entitlement programs. Stop and think about it for a moment. A few months ago, we went through a 35-day partial shutdown of the government because politicians in Washington could not come to an agreement over spending for 7.5% of the government. Yeah, you heard that right. It was only over spending for 7.5% of the government. You see, two-thirds of the money spent every year by the federal government is spent on three programs, Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare. And that money is spent automatically without anyone in Congress ever having to vote on it. The politicians set it up that way so no one could ever accuse them of cutting their benefits. And probably also so they never had to make very many tough decisions about it. But the result is that it, the benefits keep growing and growing and growing until they're out of control. And if we don't do something soon, that out of control spending will bankrupt us. 
the trustees of the Social Security and Medicare trust funds are required to report annually on the state of their trust funds. Friends, it's not good. The Social Security trust fund, they tell us, will be empty by 2034. The Medicaid trust fund is even worse off. It will be empty by 2026. That's just two presidential elections from now. If we don't do something before then, beneficiaries will see their benefits cut or taxpayers will see their taxes go up or both. We'll be facing intergenerational warfare as young people see their taxes skyrocket to pay for seniors who are living far longer at far greater costs than was ever imagined when Social Security was first created. When Social Security was first created, it was to establish some kind of retirement security for Americans over 65, the average American lifespan was the age of 62. In 1940, less than 1% of Americans were 65 or older. When Social Security was created, there were 16 workers paying into it for every one beneficiary who drew benefits. Today, the average American lifespan is almost 79 years, and almost 20% of our population is 65 and older. There are only three workers for every one person drawing benefits right now. Imagine being on the foredeck of the Titanic, navigating through an iceberg, except it's the middle of a sunny day. You see a massive iceberg ahead, miles in the distance. You know that if you don't change course, you're going to crash and then sink. But the good news is it's a sunny day, it's miles ahead of you, and you have time to change course. That's where we are today. We have time to change course. We can see a disaster looming, but if we don't get it done, it will be a disaster. So we're going to launch a second project later this year to build support for entitlement reform so our children and our children's children can live better lives than we've known with greater opportunities than we've had because that is the American dream. We share similar goals. That is why you're here and you are here to make a difference. The dream of freedom unites and motivates millions across the world and has for centuries. President Reagan said, as long as that dream lives, as long as we continue to defend it, America has a future and all mankind has reason to hope. Reagan knew what you and I know, that all over the world, America is rightfully seen as the land of liberty. Our first Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, called America the last best hope on earth. Even refugees from communism in the 1980s knew it, like the Vietnamese boat people. More than three decades ago, in October 1982, John Mooney was a young Navy man on the USS Midway. They were so moved by a letter that they sent it to President Reagan, who read it as part of his address to the nation, on, or his radio address on the Saturday before Christmas. Dear Mom and Dad, today we spotted a boat in the water. We picked up 65 Vietnamese refugees. It was about a two-hour job of getting everyone on board. I see it. It was about a two-hour job of getting everyone on board, screened by intelligence, checked out by medical, fed, and clothed. Now they're resting on the hangar deck, and the kids, most of them seem to be kids, are watching what is probably the first television set they've ever seen, watching Star Wars. Their, their boat was sinking as we came alongside. They'd been at sea for five days and had run out of water. A couple more days and those kids would have been in pretty bad shape. I guess once in a while we need a jolt like that to realize, a jolt like that for us to realize why we do what we do and how important really it can be. I mean, it took a lot of guts for those parents to put their kids in a leaky boat in hopes of finding someone to take them from the sea. So much risk. But apparently, they felt it was worth it rather than live in a communist country. For all of our problems with the price of gas and not being able to afford a new car and other creature comforts this year, I really don't see a lot of leaky boats heading out of San Diego looking for Russian ships out there. One picture blazed in my mind. As they approached the ship, they were all waving and trying as best they could to say, hello, America sailor. 
Hello, freedom, man. It's hard to see a boat full of people like that and not get a lump somewhere between chin and belly button. And it really makes one proud and glad to be an American. People were waving and shouting and choking down lumps and trying not to let other brave men see their wet eyes. A lieutenant next to me said, yeah, I guess it's payday in more ways than one. We got paid today, and I guess no one could say it better than that. America will be the land of the free only as long as she remains the home of the brave, as long as we, the people, stand for liberty. And we will be free because of people like that John Mooney in 1982 who defend us today. And like each one of you working across this country to stand for freedom and to expand personal freedom and the economic freedom. Because of your efforts and the efforts like all of you across this country, freedom will endure. A little over 10 years ago, only a, two dozen people were talking about tea parties. Now, today, there's rarely a political conversation that doesn't involve us. I, I see how far we've come, and I know what we can do in the months and weeks ahead. I know why you do this work in the middle of the night, on weekends like this, at 2 o'clock in the morning. You do it for the same reason I do. We dream of an America that lives up to her promise. Our dreams are lofty because we cherish personal freedom. We know our work isn't done until everyone, especially those we elect to represent us, puts value on personal freedom too. Most of all, we do this work because we care about our legacy, because it is our responsibility to leave a debt-free nation with enduring freedom so that our children can soar in their pursuit of the American dream. Thank you, and God bless you. God bless America. Thank you. Crop TV.